thank you for making time for this broadcast. We appreciate you greatly. Um, welcome to a special edition of Race Talk Revolution, where your voice matters. And I am your host and founder of Race Talk Revolution Incorporated, Lane Cobb. I am here today with my co-host, uh, AJ Woodson, who is editor-in-chief of Black Westchester Magazine and co-host of People Before Politics Radio. This is the last of four collaborative programs between Race Talk Revolution and Arts 10566, a community-based organization in the Austin and Peekskill area of New York committed to bringing equity, community engagement, youth development, and wellness to its residents. This program is made possible by a grant uh, from the Rockefeller Brothers Partnership, and these monthly discussions have focused on the intersection between race, ethnicity, culture, and the arts. Our title for this evening's conversation is Life Lessons, Cultural Conversations for Career and Relationships. Each of our panelists this evening comes with a wealth of experience in the arts and has been recognized for their contributions in their chosen area. The first part of our program will be interview format. We're gonna hear from each of our panelists and then viewers will have an opportunity to ask questions directly. Uh, when that time comes, we will uh, instruct you on how to raise your hand. Um, until that time, we ask that you please remain muted. Before we introduce our panel, I'm gonna invite uh, Jermaine Smith to talk a little bit about Arts 10566 and to share with us why this conversation about the intersection of arts and race is important. Jermaine. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. And thank you, Reverend Cobb, for hosting another um, amazing podcast. And welcome to all of you. And thank you for our panelists for joining. Um, Ars 10566 is, is a program I'm here to represent on behalf of Ars 10566. And as a program that started while we're Fredo Morel and Peace Guerrero that bring arts to the um, Black and Hispanic community. Um, and this this engagement and dialogue is important to to how we interact as a society. And we, we've We've engaged in these podcasts over the last um, couple months um, as a as a partnership with the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and their community engagement effort um, to bring dialogue to the masses. And um, Lane Cobb has been gracious enough to host these podcasts, and um, I'm truly honored to be here. Um, I want to really jump into it um, to get everyone started, so we can have um, in depth dialogue about our topic tonight, and then give the audience an opportunity to really. Um, ask questions at the end so i won't go too long um but i i'm co-founder of um in you which is the organization that builds up a number of workshops in collaboration with ours 566 with my partner tamara bridgewater um and we are our local community organization based out of austin that does community engagement and youth development work um and if you guys have any questions or want to get involved in any of the work that we do i will include my name and email address in the chat so we can connect anytime after this podcast but um, i want to get back to reverend cobb and allow our panelists to get going and so we can engage in this dialogue this evening thank you all for joining Thanks, Jermaine. And thank you to all of our panelists. Um, and uh, we actually have one panelist who we will who will be arriving late. Um, leading our panel this evening is the fabulous award winning sculptor, Vinnie Bagwell. An untutored artist with remarkable talent, Ms. Bagwell is a native of Yonkers, New York. She is credited with reframing public art to include historic black images. Her first public artwork, The First Lady of Jazz, was commissioned by the city of Yonkers in 1996 and is the first public artwork of a contemporary African-American woman to be commissioned by a municipality in the United States. That statue commemorates jazz great Ella Fitzgerald. Since that time, she has created and installed numerous works of art across this nation depicting Black historical figures, including the enslaved Africans' rain garden, an urban heritage public art project featuring five life-size bronze statues at the Hudson River in Yonkers to commemorate the legacy of the first enslaved Africans to be manumitted by law in the United States. Victory is an 18-foot statue uh, of an angel outside New York City's Central Park on Fifth Avenue and 103rd Street, and a seven-foot statue of Sojourner Truth commissioned by New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation for the walkway over the Hudson in Highland. And those are just three of her many contributions to public spaces in the New York area. Her sculpture has received national recognition 
and international recognition, I, I, I imagine, Vinny, and you can correct me, uh, and can be seen across the country. You can find out more at vinniebagwell.com. Nathan Trice is, an, is the artistic director and founder of Nathan Trice Rituals Project by Project Dance Theater based in New York City. The company was founded in 1998 and consists of a nucleus of multi-talented artists with diverse backgrounds of expression. The collaborative mission of the artist is to create work that severs those, excuse me, I'm gonna start over. The collaborative mission of the art artist is to create work that serves those who seek the reflective importance of being human through art in a visual, audio, sensory, theatrical performance. Originally from Detroit, Michigan, um, Nathan began his training in 1989 under the strict direction of Alauni Chun in San Diego at Mesa College. And while training, he simultaneously completed his remaining two years of a four and a half year commitment to the US military naval service. Upon completion of his naval contract, he was accepted into the Alvin Ailey Certificate Program. And since completing that program, he has worked with Momix, Complexions, Joseph Holmes, Chicago Dance Theater, Donald Byrd, The Group, Danza, Isa, Burt Sugar Orchestra, Forces of Nature Dance Company, and Heidi Latsky Dance Theater. Mr. Trice is co-founder of the Anti-Racist Coalition for Faith, Ethical, and Spiritual Communities, working with the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond to bring the Undoing Racism Workshop to faith communities. He is also the co-founder of Artists Co-Creating Racial Equity on Affinity Group of People's Institute. You can find more about him at nathantricerituals.com. Actress, singer, and award-winning storyteller April Armstrong weaves melodies and words for a refreshing and compelling style of storytelling. Her story programs are fun and interactive. She tells stories for schools, colleges, libraries, museums, and festivals. She tells multicultural folk tales, including those originating in the African-American and Latinx historical experience. April's stories delight, inform, and inspire audiences of all ages. She has performed for local and international audiences alike and has appeared on stage, television, and film, touring in companies and also appearing in One Woman Productions that pay homage to icons such as Billie Holiday and Bessie Coleman, among others. Ms. Armstrong is the recipient of the National Storytellers Network 2020 J.J. Renault Emerging Artist Award for Storytelling, as well as the 2015 Bronx Brio Award for Storytelling. Her CD, The Cat Came Back, Stories and Songs with a Jazzy Twist, has won a Parents' Choice Award silver medal. Welcome to all of our panelists. Is April here yet? All right, so we will convene without her and Nathan. Ah, there you are. So great to see you, so happy. All right, so welcome and happy Black History Month to everybody. Thanks so, so much for being here. Uh, we ask you all to, to talk about your experience as Black artists, um, and we know that isn't an easy road in the racialized society we live in. Um, and what we see when we look at, um, at you all are people who are using your art to elevate the lived experience of Black and Brown people, and also to educate the audience about who we are and how we contribute to society. So what I'm thinking is that we are going to um, just have some questions from our viewers, but we wanna start by um, asking whether each of you can maybe just take three minutes. Don't laugh. I know you have a long <laughs> and illustrious career, but we'll get to that. What's your path been like? And, and maybe what is just one thing that you have had to learn along the way? And, and Vinny, if, if we'd start with you, that'd be great. My passion is making art. Um, I just wanna do it. I mean, I've been like this my entire life. Um, at some point it occurred to me that I could use my gift and my education and represent my race. Um, when it occurred to me that there was so little, almost non-existent art in public places about Black people, it occurred to me that that was what the gift was for. Um, public art is a white patriarch arena. And when I say that, I mean that most of the art in public places that represents history or 
uh, American history is more than 90% of it is done by white men, very few women in the industry, even fewer people of color. Um, I think that because of the way that we have been marginalized, it is so important now that we're finally getting a turn to tell our own stories, um, you know, with the coming of Black Lives Matter and, um, you know, all of the craziness that we're seeing in the news, police brutality, you know, uh, just craziness. Um, public art is a practical way of balancing the American narrative. And I'm so happy um, to be one of the few people in the arena that has the opportunity to do that for us. Thank you. Um, that three minutes? Yeah, it was per it's perfect. <laughs> I wasn't timing you. You, I, you know, I know better than that. <laughs> Nathan. What what's what's it what's your journey been like a little bit and and what's one lesson that you've perhaps learned? Yeah, the journey though, I mean, it, it you know, at the end of at at the end of it all, you know, uh, if if we still can do things like this, meaning we as in Black people, we still can, can engage in art. It's quite an it's quite an amazing ride when you know the history of our people and what we've gone through, and to be able to like do this you know, and live this life. It's a, it's an honor, it's a privilege, it's a prayer. It's a, it's a vision of our people. Uh, I'm, I'm that vision. And so I know that my work has to respond to that vision of our people. So that's what it's about. Um, uh, one thing I've learned, uh, is that what you said, Lane? One thing I've learned, was that one of the prompts? Yeah. One thing I've learned is that, uh, one thing. Um, it's it's a two part thing. Stay spiritually grounded and don't take it all personal. That's a big lesson. That's a huge lesson. April Armstrong has joined us. Welcome, April. Thank you. <laughs> I'm on my phone now because Zoom needed to update my uh, laptop, and when I updated my um, desktop. It really messed it up. So now I don't know what's going on. It Zoom, seems so. to be that kind of night. It's all right. It We're taking it in stride. We're playing jazz here. So what how, what has your journey been like as an artist of color, you know, using your art to um, elevate um, stories of uh, people of African descent, but also to educate about our contributions and just kind of be self-expressed? What's been your journey? And um, what is one lesson that you've learned? And we'll get to more of them, but what is one that you can share right now? Gee, um, I, as, um, as a black woman in, uh, so I have two, two or three careers going on kind of at the same time. So I've been in theater um, and in, in theater, I'm including television and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then as a um, storyteller, primarily going into schools, into libraries, um, and then as a teaching artist, where that's mostly schools, uh, some centers, um, community centers. The thing that has impressed me the most um, for me is uh, having watched things change over the years. Um, personally, I have seen where there used to be many more um, people of color, uh, black principals in schools, in the New York City public school um, system. I feel like there's been a little bit of a diminishing of that. Um, I think there are less principals that I'm noticing. Um, so that's kind of been an issue. Um, I'm kind of noticing that as much as we try to change it and as much as we try to instill things in kids, there's still so much they don't know. There's still, when we talk about Black History Month, for instance, as a storyteller, um, it's like the same two or three people that, you know, Martin Luther King, Harry Tubman, <laughs> you're lucky if you get a Frederick Douglass in there, like they just don't know. And that is kind of surprising to me at the need for black art 
the need for that. It just doesn't seem to be gelling, you know, as much as I would like it to be. Um, I like to go into a school and say, do you know about this person? And they all raise their hand and go, yes, you know. Um, so that's been interesting. As a person of color in the theater, well, Black Lives Matter was really, um, wow, uh, a huge jumping off point. People really putting their careers on the line for speaking up and speaking out about the aggressions and microaggressions that they were feeling. Um, I can't really say that that has been my personal issue because I have constantly from the beginning kind of, I've been this person that wasn't typical when I went in. I was like, well, you, why, of course you're, I can do Eliza Doolittle. What are you thinking? And because I was able to do some of these things for a while, I thought everything's kind of like, okay, what's the problem? But then I realized after a while, that's the exception. That's the exception. And it's taken so many years. There aren't that many Audra McDonald's. The, uh, people are still, it's, it's an anomaly when you see that kind of diversity in a show. Um, so that's been an issue for me, watching that happen, being involved in that. Um, how diverse can you be and, and what is the point of it? And is it getting somewhere? And what is the message for, for our uh, youth? Do you, you know, but it's so important when we see ourselves up on the stage. Just any kind of representation is so important. And then after that, after the foot in the door, after we see, then it's like, well, what are you saying? Mm -hmm. And what are the shows that are saying something about our experience and to uplift? And um, it's hard for people to see Black people in an uplifted way, I feel. Mm. So that continues to be a challenge, I think, for everybody. Mm. So let, let me ask everybody, and then I'm going to ask AJ, make sure that if you have a question, just unmute and ask Jermaine as well. Um, how do you, Vinny, how do you decide what art, uh, what you're going to do, who, what your subject matter is going to be, um, where you'd like to um, have your, where and how you'd like to have your art displayed? Which is I think um, for me, having a public relations background um, helps me to discern where the most value is. Um, like anybody who tells stories, I like a good story. Um, I like it to have a lot of meat in the bones. Um, and of course, the, the joy, of course, is going after good stories and then winning the opportunity to tell them. Um, what I'm understanding also now, because most of the artwork that I'm doing is outside in public places, I'm realizing that it's an opportunity to create more civic engagement. So for instance, now we have, of course, social media, we've got apps, we've got all these different ways that people can connect for information. Um, I'm realizing that that's an opportunity for art in public places. It's not enough to just put a pretty sculpture of, let's just say Frederick Douglass or you know some unknown person. It's like, tell the person the backstory, explain to them why this is here, why does this matter? you know, what's the gravity of this? And again, it creates on-site learning opportunities for all the things that aren't being put in the curriculum in the schools, um, for all of the history that um, is trying to be subjugated when you create a public artwork, it's gonna be there for a couple of hundred years. You have a real opportunity to tell a story. And so oftentimes when people come to me and they ask me, well, what stories do you think are, are important? I'm like, well, you know, I'm, I'm feeling kind of like everybody else, it's like, well, how many Martin Luther King sculptures do you need when there are so many other really, really important stories, valuable stories, impactful stories that could be told locally? Um, so, you know, most of the time I'm advocating for a local history. Like, so who was, who was Walter Doc Hurley? Who is that? You go to Hartford, everybody in Hartford, Connecticut knows this guy. He sent more than 500 kids to college. You know, the point of it is, is that there are a lot of everyday people um, in regular towns that have done remarkable things that have contributed to the American narrative. And since it's now our turn to talk and tell our own stories, I think these are really valuable stories um, to get out there. The challenge always is funding. Where's the money coming from? Um, oftentimes we are not funding our own stories. 
Um, you know, we're looking for funding coming from other places like municipalities and state governments and federal governments and foundations and things like that. Um, but again, legacy work is not something that African Americans have been informed about in terms of, you know, if you're gonna put your money somewhere, put it in legacy. You know, legacy is where you're telling a story and you're putting it someplace permanently and you're ensuring that the, the, the heritage of black people continues. Um, that right there is a whole talk show. Mm, it is indeed. So, so Nathan, how about you? I mean, Vinny, Vinny said, was just talking about funding and I know that for dance companies, funding is always an issue, right? There's, there's so much overhead. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, this is America, you know, when we compare that to Europe, where it's subsidized, it's, it's a completely different thing here, you know, so we, we, we have to, I think one of the things that, um, in terms of funding, I had to really come to grips with is that it has to, on some level, it has to be monetized. Um, whether that you, you use certain language that the funder goes, oh, we like this, and they're going to give you the money. You know, uh, we language it in a way that it, that that speaks money language to the funder. You know. Um, and funders, you know, a lot of them, they're writing off. It's a tax write-off for them. And they want to be able to say, we funded this arts program for this community. So we feel good about ourselves. So, you know, there's all these transactional sort of uh, dynamics that go along with funding in America. Um, they're really intense. They're right in your face. And you have to sit down with yourself and go, okay, how do I engage with this? in a way where it doesn't just begin and end as transactional. And, and, and I can be able to do it in a way where it's being intentional about transactional activity uh, for the sake of transformation. You know, I, I wanna be able to go, okay, let me, let me write this a certain way so I can get the money, but I wanna go into the community and I wanna somehow make a piece of art that uh, reflects the community here's how you can empower yourselves. You know, here's how you can see yourselves. I, I don't want to own, I don't want to be the author of how they should move forward. I want to actually come in and say, hey, you know, I can make a work that reflects a conversation with you that says how, this is how you would like to move forward. I can make an art, a piece of work that does that. But I don't want to get into um, telling people how to do it. There's a way to bring art to communities and where you empower the community and you step out of the community and let the, uh, the community continue going forward. I think art can do that. Um, I sat down with the question for the last, for about 10 years, which was why does art matter? I started the question back in 2012 and it was kind of a, a charge to myself to really answer that question in these times. Why does art matter? Who cares? You know. Look at the world, you know, um, unless it's going to be popular culture, unless it's going to be pop art, you know, on some level, you know, we know how it is now. It gets a lot of attention. Um, but in terms of what I do, which is not pop art in a sense, it's not the most popular thing. Why does it matter? Why should people spend their time and, and go see what it is that I do? And I had to really sit down and struggle through that question. And I, I came out with whatever I do, I have to do it in community. I have to go, it's similar with Vinny was saying, I have to go to the community. I come up with an idea, right? And I go, let me gather some people together and talk in the community and talk about this idea and, and let them tell me, you know, the perspectives, you know, that shape it, that mold the work, the final work. And so uh, that's better for me. That makes it feel like a bit more communal. That makes it feel less um, individualistic in a sense. In my, in my previous, my earlier artistic practices, it was like, look at me talk about this thing and look at the way that I see this thing. That's and curatorial thought, okay, art though. What, what, you're, what you're talking about is the difference between curatorial art and public art. That last little thing you said, that's how curatorial yeah. artists approach making art. Public artists yeah. are a totally different angle. And unfortunately what we're seeing, and we're seeing it a lot lately, um, what we're seeing is a lot of people who are geared towards curatorial art trying to approach public art the same way it don't work. Um, in, in public art, um, let's just talk about regular public art, specifically that's geared towards 
Black history. Let's just talk about that kind of public art because that's mostly what I do. There's the facts, like there's the true story. And then there's the community that you're telling the story to. So you've got the local community, and then of course you've got the community at large. In curatorial art, and we saw it many years ago, there was an exhibition at the Whitney where they had this pile of elephant dung and they qualify what it represented. People were like, what? Stop, okay? It's like, you don't do that with public art. With public art, it needs to speak for itself. It's not subject to the artist stand there for like a year and a century trying to explain what it means. The artwork is supposed to be articulate, coherent. And so again, part of the challenge sometimes with public art is that you have to keep reminding people that when you're talking about specifically black history, you have to be very, very discerning, very, very carefully how you present it. Because as you said earlier, everybody in this country is not steeped in art. This country, this country is not steeped in art. So there's a lot of things that a lot of people just don't know. They know what they like, they know what they don't like, but we're not only talking that simply, we're talking about, as you say, something that has meaning, something that has substance, substance that is instructional, something that, again, resonates over time. And so, um, you know, this is the part where you really have to spend some time trying to help people understand literally what matters, particularly if you're talking about permanent public art. So I have, I'm sorry, I have these sirens behind me. Um, so I'm curious about the, you said that people, a lot of times people don't know what they're seeing. They don't know what they're looking at. How do you evaluate your work? Nathan or April, how do you evaluate, evaluate your work and go to market with it and make sure that what you are, what you are presenting and what you are charging for your work is, is appropriate? Because I know a lot of times that uh, people of color will undervalue their work in the society. Um, yeah, this is something I've been working on. Um, I had done a storytelling, you know, when we were doing COVID, we were doing a lot of online uh, performances. And I remember doing something for, um, um, uh, one of the big corporations, uh, I think it was Microsoft. And this woman contacted me and she, a uh, very, very nice woman and uh, sister. And she was, you know, we, we got to the point where we were exchanging phone numbers because we had had a lot of emails. And when I started to talk to her on the phone, she was like, I'm really glad you called me because I was going to tell you, you're not charging enough money. I was like, oh, and we went into a whole conversation about it. And I was like, yeah, it's a problem. I'm not charging enough money. How do I know what to charge? It's nobody, this is not a course we take. This is not something we're born knowing or just because we're talented or you come out of school knowing how to do the business of your art. Um, Vinny, if you have, uh, a degree in what did you say? Um, Psychology. Right. right. <laughs> uh, you may know that a little bit better, but a lot of us just don't have that. So um, the, because I'm wearing these multiple hats, right? Because I'm an actor and I'm hired by theaters and I do whatever that production is. I'm a part of that. But then I have my own thing, right? Where I'm like, for instance, my show about um, Bessie Coleman, Two Wings to Heaven. She was our first African-American aviatrix. You know, it's, it's hit or miss. And you can call people. And I always felt like we need a network. It would be wonderful to have a network of Black artists that talk about pricing, that talk about how do we get the publicity for this? How do we get our people into the theater? What do we do when we go to um, my issue, even with theater things? And as, I, and as I'm aging, when I show up at that performance, at that theater, at that venue, there's a whole, I look at, in the audience and there's hardly any black people there. I've been How do we get those four people? Times and I, I know what you mean. Right. How do we get those people into the theater? One case in point, I remember being in um, 
Charlotte and doing a show there, the small theater company. Okay, now, so they invite me to the um, uh, marketing uh, meeting. And I'm sitting there, you know, and everybody's white. And um, they're saying, so uh, what are we doing? And um, eventually it got to the point where they do you have any, April, do you want to lend, do you have any ideas about this? And now mind you, there were two people in this show, me and a white man, an older white man. And I was an Anthel Fulgar play. And I said, I don't understand what's happening here. You say you want black people in the theater, do you put my picture in the newspaper? No. You put his picture in the newspaper. But he was he was the local person and people knew him. Yeah, the white people knew him. <laughs> but I was like, why wouldn't you put a picture with both of us in it? Or why wouldn't you put a picture of me and then him? So we can see there's two people in this show. That's a curiosity. That would bring people who's in. Do, again, who's doing the public relations? And again, who's doing the public relations? Where, where, where are they coming from? But right. um, I just want to interject a little humor. I'm sorry. When people call me up and say, what, what price should I say? I say to them, what can you say without laughing? Can you say $10,000? Can you say $50,000? Can you say six? What can you say without laughing? I mean, I've had a couple of people call me up and they, and they laugh the whole time. It's like, no, no. For real, can you say ten thousand dollars and be like, "That's my price"? Can you say that? You know, and of course, it, I, I'm an old car salesperson, so from where I come from, it's like, no, hit them high and come down. Don't start low and hope there's no place to go if you start low. And of course, there's something called homework. It's like, well, whose category do you consider yourself to be in? I mean, when I first started sculpting, right. I was looking at Richard Hart. Well, shoot, Richard Hart was very famous, but I was looking at the pricing for his bronzes and I'm like, I'm sorry, I think I could put mine next to Richard Hart. I'm gonna price it just a little bit lower. And of course my prices have been the same for quite some time. But the point of it is, is that the question is, what do you think about yourself and, and the value that you bring? And for a lot of people, like you say, this is not something they teach in art school. They don't teach business in art school. So you have to try to figure out, number one, what will the market bear? And, and number two, what's, what's anybody else that doing something even vaguely like you doing, charging, whatever. Sometimes if you're a real anomaly, there's nobody like you, you don't know what to do. Well, then it circles back around to what you think is the value for what you're doing, considering everything that you have to do, because the artwork is one thing, the administration and all the other kind of stuff you've got to do to get the artwork done is a whole lot more time. And the question is, are you paying yourself for that? You know, so you kind of have to really understand the value of your entire business, not just the product itself, because there's a lot of hidden time and money right. that goes into making an artwork, whether it's curatorial or public art. There's a, it's a lot of stuff that goes into it. You know, I mean, most of my days are spent in the car answering emails at red lights, forgetting to, to put things in my phone because I'm not sitting at a desk all day. You know, I don't, I don't, I'm not on a laptop all day. A lot of people think that, oh, you're just sitting around, you know, drinking your tea, making artwork all day. It's like, no, that's what happens in the middle of the night, you know, after I've gotten a second win. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's a challenge trying to figure out, as you say, number one, what matters, what has the most value, and what's the number that you put to that? Right, and there's travel. And as I learned tonight, because before I got here, I was at a UPS trying to send the props for the show, some set pieces. And it was about a box, and it was about where am I gonna get all this stuff from? And then I realized, oh my God, if this is the price going, I have it's gotta come back. And then it may have to go to another place in, in a few weeks and can't go there early. So a lot of the stuff is circumstantial. For, for me, it, uh, I, I call people I know. I try to, you know, let me take you out for coffee. Let me, let me pick your brain. Let me find out how to do these things. Sometimes well, it's- Part uh, of your price point too. Again, you, you try right. to explain to people, you know, when you hit them where you hit them and they go, ow, you're like, oh, wait, let me help you. Let me tell you what you're paying for. You're paying for this, 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 and this. Oh yeah, and this, and this, and this. Oh yeah, and the artwork. 
Right. And a lot of times people, because they don't know this arena, True. Um, it's not an easy arena to learn. Um, it just isn't. Um, a lot of things escape them completely. I'm talking about people who commission public art regularly. You know, mm -hmm. I'm turning into an auntie over here because I'm constantly saying, whoa, 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 whoa. That's not how this is going to happen. Let me let, no. Who said that? You know, you have to help to inform people, educate people. And it's an on the job uh, experience. You learn as you go. And if you're smart, you try to educate the people that you're working with or the people that you're working for so that they know what to expect. So um, let, let me jump in here. Let me jump in here. What I'm hearing is, thank you so much. For, uh, what I'm hearing is that you need to educate yourself as a creator. You need to educate yourself about every aspect of the work that you do. Right. You have to educate yourself and you have to educate other people. Jermaine, you had a question. Uh, you yeah. yeah. Um, well, two part question, but also wanted to um, add into that, that a lot of artists don't also include the fact or, or educate their um, their clients to the fact that you're also paying for the years of expertise that I've learned over the years of how to make this art. So that's one thing that I think a lot of artists don't explain when they're talking to clients. They talk about like what the, the materials and the time and the travel but you're paying, it's like a surgeon, right? You're not just paying for that surgery, you're paying for that years. I went to school and learned this trade. And so there's a lot of thing that, that people are including in that. Um, you know what I charge you for? I charge you for peace of mind. <laughs> right. Like, yeah, yeah, experience comes peace of mind. I know what I'm doing. Yeah, you know, exactly. I don't know what they're doing. And it's like, and if you feel like crap shit, go ahead, pick somebody else. Right. You know, again, a lot of people take peace for granted. And there's a lot of things that can go wrong in the process of creating public art, dealing with curatorial art. You know, I've had things break in transit and nobody want to be responsible. All kinds of things happen. Somebody got to handle that. And the question is, how do you handle it well and painlessly so that everybody doesn't feel it? You know, there's right. a whole lot that goes into it that people just, well, they don't know until they know. So and you're it's nice to have somebody that, that's you know, experienced. What yeah, did you want to ask? So, um, two part, so my two, I have two questions and they overlap. When we envision this podcast and this this particular um, episode in the series, this was around the talk that Black communities have about their experience growing up in their neighborhoods and things like that. And we wanted from the artist perspective and this conversation kind of overlap with that because my, I'm curious as to whether or not as artists, as an art community, do you have something similar to the talk on how to survive the nuances of being a Black artist in whatever genre of art that you're doing so whether or not you have a similar conversation and it may not be how to survive like you know as black parents you tell your kids like what to do hands on 10 and 2 when a police pull you over and those type of things those extreme um things that we talk about but as black artists these type of conversations the nuances of um like the marketing and making sure that you are on the material and like those little things as as artists and as people in the art community do we have those type of conversations this is one part and the second part is um as part of this work we did a, a documentary screen of black art and absence of light and one thing that was uh, that high that i highlighted from that is the the idea of representation and um this goes to i think a conversation that april talked about um that spoke about earlier about with with um civil rights movement we have we talk about we learn about martin luther king from kindergarten to we graduate college and, and, we, and we have the same thing within the art world i think it's something similar and how can we educate and show representation not only as artists but as curators as collectors as event space owners where we can educate people and let them know that there's other people outside of basquiat and outside of these two or three names that people who are outside of the art community know where we can educate our local communities, we can educate a little broader spectrum of there's other people, not just artists, there's curators, there's collectors that you know about, there's these event spaces that you should know about, not only as artists, but as a community, and how can we expand those conversations? So one is about the talk and one's about educating people to, to show a larger scale representation in the art community. Nathan, do you can you jump in on this one? Because we haven't heard from you for a few minutes. You're um yeah can you hear me yes so are you yeah just just there's a lot of there's a lot of different dynamics we're talking about um and so i just want to make sure i'm hearing you correctly you want to know about how to educate the community and the artist on representation uh jermaine is that right yeah so I, the second part yeah so how how the best i guess let's take it from the local perspective because this is one one thing that vinnie was highlighting from a local perspective 
what would be the best tool or, or avenue to go down to educate people to the arts, not only about the artists, but about collectors, curators, potential event space that these artists can show up. And so I, I guess that's the, the, the crust of that question. Like how, as, a, as an organization, how can I best do that um, to support art, the arts? To, to support black art in specific? Black art particularly, yes, yep. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I, I would say you have to create a collective. If you do it by yourself, you're always gonna feel this way. You're gonna be asking this question over and over and over and over. So you have to find like-minded people from those particular different artistic practices that, that think the same thing, that feel the same need and urgency. So you're not doing it by yourself. You get a collective. And then for me, uh, I was saying earlier, that one of the reasons why I actually go into the community is because it is this piece around, I'm hearing their stories. I'm inspired by their stories around a subject that I'm interested in making art about. At the same time, our conversations will delve into what is art? Why does art matter? and what kind of art has been made already. What are the classic names and what are the community names or artists rather? So it goes, it, for me, it's all about sitting with the local community and having the dialogue with them as I make a piece of art. And that becomes a doorway to have all these conversations that we're talking about right now, educating people around what art is, yeah, what it's craftsmanship, what, what we determine is good and bad is based on taste. Yeah, and also some kind of back education, you know? So. I, I always think at this point now, if I'm going to make anything, I'm going to go to the community first. I'm going to engage in a conversation with them. I'm going to ask other artists on some level, can we gather, right? So we can actually look at like how we have our, how we, how we engage our artistic practices with local communities so we can learn from one another. And I build a collective. You know, that's, that's my way of educating the community. In terms of just the other piece that was being said about just value, um, again, for example, if I'm in, bed -Stuy, like right now I'm, I'm in residency at the Billy Holiday Theater and the people in bed -Stuy can afford a certain kind of uh, participation in art. So I look at my ticket sales and I go, okay, these folks over here, I'm not gonna charge them $25, I'll charge them $20 or $18 and senior citizens this, you know, so it's, it's an ongoing sort of like uh, shifting of what you price your art at. Me personally, what I think it is, yes, I think it's hella valuable, you know, but am I going to get, am I going to exclude that local black community that doesn't have the dollars to engage in arts? Am I going to exclude them? No, I'm going to change the value for them in terms also, of. Sponsorship comes in handy too. Like you, you ask somebody to sponsor free tickets that you can give away. I mean, that's nice too. There are lots of ways you can eat an elephant. Yeah. So all of those things there, it, it's, it's. It's really a changing situation. I, I'm in Bed-Stuy, but also I'm from Detroit, Michigan. I'm working with Detroit Institute of Art, which is a large arts organization. They're gonna get a higher dollar value for the product that I'm doing in the Billy Holiday Theater. So it's gonna change. You know, all the pre-production stuff that we were talking about, that folks were talking about, like, you know, how do you pre how do you send the package here or transport theater? That's all pre-production stuff that I learned earlier that has to be taken care of, like Vinny was saying, in a way where, if emergency happens, nobody else is feeling that. We can keep we can keep the actors and or dancers or performers still doing their best, and not worried about these mishaps. But it requires teamwork, and that that's a lot of relationship building. Now, how do you how do you how do you sit down with people in that that local community or that venue and say what's your public engagement? What is your community engagement work going on? So, April, you're saying why didn't they use both photographs? Then it's most likely the theaters and their community engagement folks, you know, what, what is their gender? What's their goal? And we do have to like speak up and say, okay, yo, I don't, I, this is not gonna work. And that's it's a tricky place to be in, right? Like your publicist also, like for instance, lucky for me, I have a publicist. She calls up and says, let me see it before you put it out. She won't let them put anything out for me without seeing it first to say, yeah, that's good. If she doesn't like it, then she'll say to them, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? But again, not every artist um, is, organized enough to have an attorney, a publicist, you know, a marketing strategist, you know, their own photographers, whatever. whatever. Most artists are not that deep into their business to be able to function like that every day, all day, every year. Um, so it, it comes down to, as the artist, you're, you're the one who has to advocate for yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and to answer his original question, um, you know, again, 
what you're talking about is parenting. Somebody's got to be a mother or a father to a project. Somebody has to be the person who creates the network, who does all the work to try to get the network pulled together. The person who has to sit down and think coherently about what do I roll out first? What, what, what's important for me to talk to artists about first? What's important for me to talk to the community about first? Then of course, you've got a variety of ways of doing it. You can do it through in studio presentations, you can do it through Zoom, you can do it, you know, as a, a collaboration in the in the real world. There's a lot of ways you can do it, but ultimately, really, really, you're gonna need funding for that too. So you have to first of all come up with the vision to figure out, first of all, who's my audience, who am I trying to talk to? What's the need for what I'm talking about? And clearly there is a need. Artists really do need to know. And then ultimately you have to come up with a strategy. And then you got to figure out a way to pay for it because most people can't afford to work for free every day, all day, week in, week out, year in, year out. You know, even if you've got a day job and you feel like you've got extra curricular time to do this sort of thing, you're going to come to a point where you're going to need help. And the question is, is there any money for that? Yeah, what I'm hearing is it takes a village and also that we have to, that, that artists are responsible for curating your our own image, right? You have to curate your image. You have to nurture that image. You have to represent. You have to be clear about who you are and make sure that your portrayal out there is true to you, um, which I imagine there are, as we are hearing, many uh, people who don't don't get that. They're just going on automatic, doing what they do, which is something that we ha you have to be careful about because your image is your uh, your product. Um, can it can like affect your product? Closing your eyes and taking your hand off the wheel. It's right. Like, you're going to exactly. go where you want to go. It's like no, no. Figure out where you want to be, how you want it to look, whatever, whatever, and then you actively make Kool Aid, make friends, as we used to say, to talk to people. And say, so can I see the 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 the, the post that you're going to put out? Can I see it? I mean, sometimes you just have to make nice with people, just so you can keep your finger on the pulse, particularly if it ever occurs to you that you're going to get usurped. Now, in this instance, for instance, April saying that happened to her in the future, April, that should never happen to you again, because down the road in the future, you're going to say to whoever's advocating or advertising for you, it's like, may I see your publication before it goes to press? You're going to want to know, and then you're going to going to have to negotiate. It's like, is it possible that I can have my picture next to that person? I realize that's the local person, but you know, I'm in this program too. And it's nothing wrong with you doing that. Yeah, I think that um, um, it was a lesson I didn't really understand uh, was when I was, was several, many years ago at this point. And um, I think, again, it, it's like, we're all at different stages, those of us that are talking right now. And, um, when you're doing something like, like a play like that, um, especially he's the, he was a senior person in the play. I, you know, um, yeah, it would have, if I had to have manager, uh, somebody like that would have known to say, this is, this should happen. This picture needs to happen. There are, there are stages. As, as everybody was talking, I was thinking about this. There, we, there are stages of our art. There are stages of where we enter and then where we're trying to get to. And we're just not going to know everything in the beginning. And, um, and then it also helps it. Like, uh, I think it was Nathan was talking about not taking things personally and understanding that each time we're doing something as, as people of color, that we are educating and our very presence is educating. And that I love the way you say, be, make nice and have a conversation. Um, I've definitely uh, learned that before. And it's curious to me, I'm feeling like definitely, um, there was a kind of a, net, a networking that was set up on uh, Martha's Vineyard in particular. Um, there was a woman there that uh, used to do all of the events. Um, she had like a little booklet and um, that you could go to the vineyard and find out, the, the, but she's not doing it anymore. So they're missing something there. And I'm thinking, what other places are we missing that kind of networking that could help us with those issues um, that we could, Mentorship. you could, uh, am I okay? Mentorship. It's like, everybody raise your hand if you, have a, you, need, a, you need a mentor. 
if you're going to be in the arts and particularly as a working artist, not just somebody who makes art for the fun of it, if you're thinking that I would really like to eat every day just making art, you know, I mean, okay, day job and making art or just making art, you need a mentor, somebody who's doing it and say, wait a minute, how did you get from like the beginning to where you are now? Most of us are mid-career now. We've been through some things. And again, um, the art arena is not for everybody. Um, it is grueling. It is challenging. It is extremely rewarding. But, you know, a lot of people don't realize, like, no, you're going to have to have a backbone. There are things you're going to have to be willing to say, do. Um, you know, there are some things you have to walk away from, like, like no, thank you. You know, and so, again, oftentimes, because most of us are brand new um, and there aren't a lot of, I'll just say, there aren't a lot, a lot, a lot of Black artists who are, quote, unquote, making it. Um, you have to figure out where can I find somebody who I can maybe take some of what they've learned and apply it to myself. You know, for instance, I'm a public artist, but it's like, mm, can't talk to you too much about curatorial art. But if you're talking about having, being self-employed as an artist and, and eating every day and, and being able to afford a decent lifestyle, it's like, oh, I can talk to that all day long. But again, mentorship, you know, you find people who are further down the road than you are. They look like they got it going on. Humble yourself, introduce yourself and say, can I talk to you? I got questions. And then listen and try to figure out whatever they say that's useful for what you're trying to do, then by all means, log that. And if the person is amenable, ask them if you can come back and ask more questions. There's nothing wrong with sharing information or asking for help. You oh. know, I think most people are more than happy to tell you something if you ask them a, a decent question that they feel makes sense that they can answer. Yeah, it's a, hum it's a humble journey. It's also a, a very bold journey, right? We have yes. to be willing to reach out. AJ, I, I invited people to raise their hand uh, if they have a question. I know that Gary has a question and then Nathan has his hand raised, but AJ, you've been very quiet during this conversation. Um, and so I wanna invite you to, to get in if you're, if you're so inclined. Hello, everybody. Sometimes I'm actually just enjoying the conversation and the flow of the conversation. And I did have questions. And you know what, sitting back, y'all have answered a lot of the questions that I had without me even asking. Um, I did have a question. It's a question for Vinny specifically. Um, in this era now of the removing the cancel culture and the removing of statues and, and sculptures now, like at that time when they created them, you know, that was what represented them. Now, are you ever concerned in, in your working now that like sometime in the future when things move to another phase that they'll be having these discussions about the stuff that you're doing? Oh, I expect that. Um, you know, the interesting thing um, is that originally public art, again, only talking about history, um, public art was created um, to advocate for white supremacy. And at some point in the last, I'm going to say 10 to 15 years, uh, it happened in the public art arena before it happened in the mainstream. Um, we began to analyze this and question how could we balance the narrative. Um, with the 2020 George Floyd um, killing and the entire world co-signing for Black people, um, everybody stopped, looked at their portfolios and realized that they present as racist because most municipalities do not have balanced narratives. So now you have this tremendous movement towards creating commissions for new public art and everybody's trying to figure out who do we wanna do? So for instance, now you see a flurry of, of calls about Harriet Tubman. She's like our, our, our biggest uh, it girl right now. You know, Harriet Tubman for Philly, Harriet Tubman for Binghamton, Harriet Tubman for Niagara Falls. Um, there's a bunch of Harriet Tubmans, the traveling Harriet Tubman. There's a bunch of, of conversations about that particular icon. Um, and then you have um, the others. I mean, the top icons would be, you know, as you know, Martin Luther King, uh, Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman. Those are like the top four. But then there's a bunch of, bunch of, bunch of, bunch of other people. Like for instance, I'm doing James Lawson for Penn State. Most people, when I say the Reverend James Lawson, most people are like, oh, I think I know him. He's like, no, 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 no. You don't think you know him or you don't know him. Um, this is a very important person. This is the guy who was the war general for the civil rights movement. Every march we ever had, this was the guy who devised it, but nobody knows his name. It's important that he's being done. And, and I feel very, very delighted that it's me. But the point of it is, is that um, 
you still have to look at who's doing the call, how it's being funded, and how they're selecting the artist to do it. Um, I really think it's important that we tell our own stories. Um, so example, if you wanna use Philadelphia as an example, Philadelphia was going to hire a white sculptor from North Carolina to do Harriet Tubman. Mm -hmm. They didn't talk to their community, they just thought that was a good idea. And then somebody from the community said, whoa, hold up, how are you gonna do that without talking to us first? And of course they made the mistake of trying to pretend like what she said didn't matter, and then she just seriously started to have an absolute meltdown nationwide. And everybody in the country had to stop and listen to this woman explain why, why black artists should be making sculptures of Harriet Tubman, why it's our turn and, and, and why we, yeah, we should be given extra points. If when, a, when a black woman shows up for a public art call, yeah, she should definitely get a point for being black and a point for being a woman because there's so few black people in the arena making public art. You can't pretend like we don't exist. We do. The question is whether or not we get a turn. So at this point, the question is how long does our turn last? Um, mm -hmm. You know, things have a way of coming and going. And at this point, it's our turn. By the way, victory is coming. She's not on uh, Fifth Avenue at 103 just yet. I'm just starting that. But point of it is, is that, you know, we get to represent ourselves for a change of pace. And the question is, while we have our 10 minutes in the sun, what are the most important stories that need, we need to get told? Particularly, well, we're in New York, but I mean, nationwide, the question is, what story do you want to tell while it's our turn? Herrick, make up your mind and get that done. Mm, that's, that's, a, that's a good piece of advice right there. AJ, can we hear from Gary and then, and then Nathan? Uh, this is a question for April. I'm not going to turn my camera on because it's flickering for some reason. I know that's really distracting, but uh, April, I have a question about attracting Black audiences. You you mentioned you've played Eliza Doolittle. My Fair Lady has always been my favorite musical. I've seen it many times. And this summer I was in London and I had a chance to see the revival that was taking place in the West End, which was excellent. And Eliza was play, being played by a Black woman. And knowing the show as thoroughly as I do, I got to thinking about that, that, wait a minute, a Black woman in 1910 in London, no matter how brilliantly tutored, seems unlikely to be accepted in London high society at that time. And then as an extra twist for the uh, particular performance I happened to go to, the understudy went on, who was white, but her father, Alfred, was played by the regular actor who was Black. So I was thinking about all this in terms of how the logic was getting twisted by the casting. And I remember in the last uh, discussion we had about the arts, Lane, your brother here was here, Keith, and he said something I've never forgotten, which is that the Western canon was not written for me. And I thought, well, would colorblind, as it's called, casting help that? So my question is, I, I, had, I talked about this with a buddy of mine, and he said, oh, Gary, you're missing the whole point. The whole point is that the color doesn't matter at all. Anybody can play anything. And I get that. So I'm wondering, in terms of attracting more of a Black audience, do you think that colorblind casting, if we can call it that, is helpful? Or is it an insult to the Black audience if it, does, if it twists the logic of the whole production? Okay, so um, I understand what you're saying. You've got a couple of issues in that particular show. Yes, that show was not written for uh, black people. It wasn't. It wasn't intended for black people uh, traditionally. And then, so my first reaction to that is, so what? Right? Mm -hmm. Why not? Why not? We, we come to a point now where if we just look at what's going, I, I can't speak to West End and I can't speak to London because that's not where I'm from and I haven't been there. But if you're gonna do a show like that in the United States, knowing how long we've been in this country and what's going on, you, I can't say that everyone in the show was white. There were many people who were part of the, um, when they had the ball, 
the ball, there is a ball, right? And they show off Eliza at the ball. That may made it very international. And they put some other people in there. Um, Cinderella has been doing that lately where everybody is not just uh, a sister act. All the nuns are not white. All the people at the ball are not, are not all white. So I think it's up to the white audience to, to ease up, right? I mean, open up a little bit, like yeah. use a little more uh, of your imagination, let it flow. Does it, does it obscure the story that much? Have you ever seen a family that is multiracial? Can a white guy have a black daughter? Sure. We yeah. never see uh, Eliza Doolittle's father's wife. Mm -hmm. Could have been a black woman. Mm -hmm. Are we to say that the, the black people were not there? Sure they were. Mm -hmm. The point is most of the time they just weren't talked about. <laughs> You can look at, I did a show today with some kids in um, Brooklyn and I do a song called Revolutionary Remix and it's about Minutemen, Black Minutemen, Black men who fought in the Revolutionary War. They were there. It doesn't mean, it just because you never heard a poem about them, doesn't mean they weren't there. Some of them were enslaved individuals, some of them were freed individuals. Some of them were fighting to get their freedom. But uh, point being, you, you can't close your eyes to it. It's, it's just because you haven't heard of it. It may be odd and maybe strange. Their story just wasn't heard. Their voices weren't heard. And now if I can do that by bringing that to children, these children were anywhere from kindergarten to sixth grade. So now they'll hear about it. When I was that age, I didn't hear about it. I didn't know there were those people, you know? Um, so you, we, we all have to have a little, you know, be a little more fluid with it. And, and you know, as we bend time and bend our minds to in, include all of these new things that we're learning about. I'm learning about new things. I had never heard of Bessie Coleman until I was like 40 years old. I just, no one told me. So, um, and then I decided to write a show about it and now it's being done at the Gravit Center. I mean, we don't know until we know. Yeah. Well, I decided in the end that the producers of this show who are not fools didn't do this by accident. I think by casting a black woman, they were trying to say exactly what you're saying that let's lighten up here, Eliza could have been black. And the, uh, they modernized the production in other ways. Get Me to the Church on Time was sung in a gay bar with guys in drag. And in the end of the show, Eliza doesn't come back to Henry, you know, the Me Too movement. So they were really trying to update a lot of things, I think, in that production. And uh, thanks for your perspective on it, because I think- sure. And you know, Gary, sometimes it works well, and sometimes maybe it doesn't work so well. <laughs> yeah. Nathan, thank you, Gary. Thank you, April. Nathan, what were you? Um, I, I I was just gonna ask uh, Jermaine, and my screen keeps moving, but uh, did I did, did I answer his question, which was a bit a bit earlier? That's all. Uh, Jermaine, I don't know if I answered your question, your your last one, but it, it's part. But I think, like you said, it's 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 a it's a broad question, and but you did answer in part. I think it's a longer conversation, and, and with definitely something I think all of us, especially the artists and the panelists, on we can take offline because it's something that we're um, really passionate about, um, really engaged in the arts, and we really want to expand that conversation and try to to educate the community that there's a larger uh, scope of this conversation. Um, so, so yeah, I, you did answer part of it, but I, I definitely think it's a, a broad, such a broad topic and and in-depth conversation that we can definitely take it offline so what is the what is the call to action for artists of color as someone who has a distinct perspective to bring to the world right and a drive which would have you choose to be an artist which would have you choose not to live to, to live this life that is a challenge 
right? As we have already discussed, what is that place of, what is that place that you come from? I'm, I'm gonna answer that. Uh, I'm gonna say, um, number one, gifts aren't random. Mm. Gifts aren't, if you're, if you're highly gifted, it's not random. Um, I, I genuinely believe that highly gifted artists are God's favorite people, that the gift is not for nothing. The question is, what do you do with it? Mm -hmm. um, I think anytime you present yourself to someone, whether you're talking one-on-one -on -one or whether you're talking in a Zoom or you're talking in the classroom or you're talking wherever you're talking, um, you have to remember, first of all, you have to remember you're black. You're black before anything else. You're a black woman. You're, you're a black artist. Um, and so if you're gonna be black, then you need to represent. That's the way I was raised. I went to historically black school. We were raised to represent. Um, you gotta come with an A game, no mediocrity. Either you're in it or you're not, make a decision. Be committed or don't. You can't do it half-assed, just can't. The other thing is, what do you really believe? Like, do you believe that you're random? Do you think that, you know, it's always gonna be hard? It's like being taken through the gauntlet of being an artist is trial by fire. You know, and you think about all these obstacles in your path, it's like, no, that's not correct. The path is obstacles. That is the path. It's always going to be obstacles. The question is, what's your attitude about it and how are you going to handle it? If you're smart, you talk to other people, you surround yourself with positive people, you prune out the negative people, and you focus on what the heck it is you think you're doing here. And anytime you can help somebody to understand the value of what you call yourself doing, then you take a minute and you explain it to somebody so they understand. When you talk to little kids, like I love the fifth graders. I, I happen to be near uh, the Hawthorne Pearls uh, School for Gifted. These are 10, 11 year olds. These kids know stuff. They come in here with their phones and I ask them a question like, so tell me, what do you think intuition is? Let's hear it. And they, they know all the, the things that they say, but it's like, no, 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 no. If you read books and you go to the professionals, they swear that there's somebody live out there. We call them God, we call them Allah, we call them a lot of things, but there's somebody live out there. And by the way, that's who artists are listening to the most. Again, the question is, why? What difference does it make? And again, if you go around a room full of kids, I'm talking about kids like 10 and under, and you ask them what they love the most, like, what do you love? What do you love? What do you love? Do this sometime when you have a classroom. Say, what do you love? What do you love? When you listen to what they talk about, they love, it's always the arts. I love to sing. I like to write songs with my guitar. I like to dance. Well, I like karate. You know, sports is an art. You know, and again, you go through a classroom of 20 kids, I guarantee you 19 out of the 20 kids are going to tell you something that's arts oriented. Occasionally, you'll have somebody who will stand there very bewildered and say, I don't know what I love. And those you got to take a little bit more time with them because they do know what they love. Maybe they don't want to say it, or maybe they're not sure just exactly which thing they want to talk about, but usually it's arts oriented. The challenge is as you grow older, particularly if you're black, unless your parents are artists, and even that doesn't always help, a lot of times you're discouraged from being an mm -hmm. artist. My mother told me I couldn't be an artist. Uh -uh, don't do that. I, I'm so proud now sometimes to tell her what I want and how much money it is. Seriously, because she told me it was impossible that, no, that's not a choice. You, you have to do something else with yourself. Yeah. And then Thanks. ultimately I discovered that I couldn't, I just, I'm compelled. I just couldn't ignore the gift. And then another gift showed up. I'm like, oh, oh God is serious. I'm just simply saying that for the average artist, talking about the people, not the people who want to be artists, who are going to school trying to be artists. I'm talking about the ones that are born, the one that came here with a obvious gift, like no question, you've got talent. Whatever it is, doesn't matter because it's all the same thing. It's a matter of expression. Doesn't matter if you're a, a, a dancer and I'm a sculptor. We come from the same place. It's still about self-expression. And in many instances, we're talking about self-expression, about being Black. Yeah, uh, that's what I want to get to, I think. Nathan, I, I'd love to ha hear your answer to that question. Like, what makes that expression in the world an imperative? And how do you, how do you lift that up? It's a hard question to get in a couple of minutes. Um, I think that um, it's about having purpose. And I think that um, once you find your purpose, you know, you, 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 you do that. If it happens to be through the creative arts, if it happens through being creative with technology, farming, 
um, whatever it may be, you know, um, I think creativity is in everyone. I think everyone is genius. Everyone has brilliance. They just need an opportunity and space to allow that to, you know, ignite and live. Um, and, and I work with young people a lot. I stopped working in the public and the uh, higher ed institutions because I felt like they were collapsing those things. They weren't really supporting those things. When I say they, I mean the institution itself. It doesn't promote that. And I think our, our country at large doesn't promote that kind of thing. So I had to create spaces outside of those to bring in young people, black and brown, um, and also people who are not black and brown, just people who really want to just like become their most humanistic selves through the arts. Um, so it's imperative for, to, to humanize folks. Um, mm. I'll leave it. Yeah, thank April. you. That, thank you. Um, yeah, um, kind of this, I think this is piggybacking on both uh, uh, Vinny and Nathan. Just remembering, uh, first of all, we can't represent we, we, we're representing who we are all the time, right? We're coming in, like you say, Vinny, we are, we're Black, I have a Black face, I'm coming in with this, I cannot ignore this. And at the on another level, whatever I am, however I'm coming in, is, is authentic in and of itself, right? There's no one way to be as a Black person. This is what was... Um, this is what was difficult when I was growing up in the community that I was in. People had, they had were pigeonholing themselves. They, they were telling themselves they couldn't do it. Not necessarily their family was telling them. They just, because they didn't see themselves in these various places. And I think this goes back to everything we were talking about tonight with community art and the artists in the community and seeing who's important and understanding that they are important. Each one of them are important. They have something to say. And what I wanted to get in here is that we have to remember that it is this exposure to art. It is the exposure to art, the introduction of art. They have to be exposed to it to know uh, what, what is possible. And then the exposure to the art will lead them to so many other things. And I love that you talked about it that way because when we what we have as artists and what we have as um athletes right or artists ath athletic artists or artist athletes right is the discipline and the discipline means i'll never forget somebody told me that muhammad ali hated to work out he didn't like working out if muhammad ali can hate working out and get to be who he was right we don't have to like it all the time, the practice and the everydayness of it, but we have to do it because we're compelled. And there is a payoff for it, the payoff, what we end up with at the end and how many people we move by it. And it's so important that we keep reminding these kids that they can do it too. And that if they look around them, there's all this art that they can participate in. And then we have to remember that sometimes, even though the art is there, they are afraid to go and see it for whatever reason. They may not feel comfortable in the place it's being represented. In a museum, in a, in a Broadway show, in a whatever, they may feel they're uninvited there. How can we invite them in? What can we do to get them involved? So, so I, I want to make sure, to one second, Vinny, I want to make sure that everybody knows how to follow all of you guys, right? So I want to make sure that we get you guys to say your uh, contact information, vinnybagwell.com, aprilarmstrong.com, and nathantricerituals.com, right? Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. Vinny, as you were saying. Oh, I just want to say, so the coolest thing happened uh, last weekend um, there's a black vegan restaurant in my neighborhood and it's run by a young black woman and she gave her restaurant over to a new black shelf for the night. She just handed him over her restaurant, said, go ahead, do your, do your thing. And I mean, he turned it out to the point where, you know, it's 830 at night. She's supposed to be closing at eight o'clock. She says, I don't want to shut it down because the vibe is so cool. All these creative people coming through, buying man's food, whatever the case may be. But it was for me, it was the idea that a professional restaurant tour 
gave her shop the whole thing over to a newbie for a night just to let him see what it would feel like to run his own joint for a day. I, I just, yeah. oh I just stood out there in the cold for a while, just talking to people going by and I just kind of watched it. I'm like, this is how you help each other. It's like you, you, you give somebody a hand and there's different ways that it can look. I mean, there's a variety of ways that you can do it, but I just thought it was so awesome yeah. that she decided to give up her restaurant for a whole night. Here you go. Let's see what you do with it. Scarcity. And of course, he rocked, you know, he rocked it. it. It gave him, I'm sure, so much energy and confidence. Like, I could do this. This is what I look like if I had my own spot. Mm -hmm. I'm just simply saying that a lot of artists need that kind of hand holding occasionally, mm -hmm. where somebody says, you know, let me help you do this. Let me show you how you do this, whatever, whatever, whatever. That's the kind of energy that, that I would like to see. Um, perpetuated. I don't mind when people call me up and ask me questions. I'm more than happy as long as you're not competing against me at the moment. I'll tell you how to win. You well, know, scare, let me, let me, I, I need to interrupt you, Vinny, because we have to get Andrea's question in and we have literally three minutes. I just want to say that scarcity is that's in white American culture, right? That is not um, an African American principle, right? So, so uh, lifting up each other and sharing opportunities absolutely is, is in our heritage. Andrea, did you have a question, my dear? I'm it so wasn't sorry. Really, it wasn't really a question. It was just, I was, you know, so much of, well, Vinny and I have met before and we just have a lot, we have a similar Sagittarian confident energy about our businesses and our art, and although she's a much more accomplished artist. But I was going to say about a couple of things. One is um, having worked with, you know, set up after school programs and been a teacher and an artist and worked in the community at, Length. In fact, when Wilfredo first moved to Peekskill, I was already up there running a program, but um, that, that taking the little guys, the little ones, the little children to the venues made such a difference. Getting, getting the kids out of Peekskill to a, a, a dance production or, and there's so many things that go on, like Lane, the, the show we went to the other day, there's so many things that go on in the community that the little guys and you know and girls don't go to because I don't know why the program directors aren't bringing them but like that Bisa Butler exhibit that was in Katona the one that was in. so there's lots of those things the other thing is in the programs I've worked in where we're mentoring young people of color the focus is on the stem careers and when you bring up stuff about being an artist it's poo-pooed just like it was to me as a child it's not it's considered sort of a a, a a side thing you know like a club you can belong to but you're not you know it's not it's not sort of supported so I think that in general I mean in 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 our country I think it's not supported which is you know obvious but I I think that um that forming some sort of collaborative where like in my arena, in my uh, daily work, in design work, I found a few people in my 20 years doing it that I could trust, that I could go to as a woman in a male dominated field where I didn't know how to price myself and I didn't know what to do. I would go to them and say, what should I do? When they'd say, you're being too nice. You need to charge this, like Vinny would say. So I think get, finding those safe people that, and then paying it forward when you make it. So I get, like many young people calling me all the time out of the blue and asking me if I can help them. And I help them in any way that I can to introduce them to, you know, to network with other people. So I think, you know, it's, it's multifold, but with the, with the young people now and the social media and all the things they're involved with, I just feel like if you can get them when they're in, preschool and grade school to be exposed and, 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 and hone their craft and have people who look like them doing the thing and being, you know, being successful. It makes a big difference. And Thank you, take... Andrea. Thank you. And I'm sorry to interrupt. We have got to bring this to a close. It is 8.30. Um, Nathan, um, did you have something three seconds long that you know that you wanted to share? I, I love to be able. I love to be able to be in a conversation that explores uh, artists that have become known as black. Because Billie Holiday, Baldwin, they left America and they understood something about 
themselves as humans and came back as black humans in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, black, black humanistic artists. That's a conversation I'd love to be able to sort of dive into. What is that? What happened to them? You know, they separated from the black experience for a moment in America specifically yeah. to find something humanistically and then came back in. Yeah. As a different kind of black person. So yeah. Yeah. We could definitely, I would love to take a deeper dive around this. We have to close this out. I want to thank our panelists, award-winning sculptor Ms. Vinnie Bagwell, actor, singer, storyteller April Armstrong, and dancer and founder of Nathan Trice Rituals Project by Project Dance Theater, Mr. Nathan Trice. Please look up all of our panelists and please follow their work. They are all amazing. If you have watched this program, you know that by now. Vinniebagwell.com, AprilArmstrong.com, and NathanTriceRituals.com. Let me also say that my co-host AJ Woodson has a new book available. Black Westchester celebrates Black women of Westchester, celebrating the, the, uh, the um, achievements of African-American women in Westchester. And Vinny is in the book and one of the women on the cover. Yes. There you go. Absolutely. It's, on, it's, on, it's available on Amazon or you can just reach out to me and get an autographed copy directly. Thank you. Thank you, Jermaine Smith. Thank you also, Tamara Bridgewater of Arts 10566. We have so enjoyed partnering with you. Um, and collaborating you to produce these programs. Um, we also appreciate the Rockefeller Brothers partnership for making these programs possible. And uh, we hope that you will join us again should we create another round of conversations around race and the arts. I think we have two more planned. I just want to give our guests uh, the last word. Maybe you can have one sentence of inspiration to the people before you go and literally one sentence, April. Um, I don't know what to say. Uh, <laughs> thanks for listening. <laughs> awesome, thanks for listening. I love that one. Nathan. Imagination and creativity is the way. Excellent, and Vinny. Just focus, you know, just, just get clarity and focus and don't be afraid to ask for help. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jermaine. Last words from you, please. Um, I just want to thank everyone for joining. Uh, great conversation. We are absolutely going to do another um, two more in the series outside of the scope of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. The next one is going to be all women's panel. So Lane, we're going to get together and organize that for this month. But I just want to say to all the artists out there, while your art is worth what someone's willing to pay, your artistry is un invaluable. So make sure you get with you, your art. It's to maximize your value, speaking to what Nathan said earlier. So um, again, thank you for everyone for joining tonight. I appreciate you all. <clears throat> AJ? Um, I just want to, I didn't speak much, but I learned a lot and I got a lot out of this. And sometimes, you know, I, it's good to just listen. Uh, I, 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 I celebrate you all and I was glad to be part of this conversation. Thank you to everyone. And if you'd like to review this, it will be archived on the Race Talk Revolution YouTube platform. Thank you, everyone. Thank Have you. a wonderful evening. Good night. Celebrate back history, everybody. Take care. Come on. Bye.